Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver Elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30-day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 468. In this episode, Scott talks with Andrew Dupree about electrical engineering. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today on our March is for Makers series in cooperation with Code Newbies, we have Andrew Dupree. He's a hardware design engineer and he's got a master's from Stanford, and which is fantastic because I went to community college and I am thrilled to be talking to you, sir. All right. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Scott. <laughs> now, you uh, work at Mind Tribe, is that correct? I do. And that's a, it's a creative consultancy that focuses on uh, making products. So I've got an idea and I go to Mind Tribe and they will make it a reality. Right. We're a product development consultancy, which is a real mouthful for saying that we help people build hardware products. Mm -hmm. And you, your whole focus has been hardware since, since the beginning. You, you're not a software person? Uh, well, I do kind of toe the line a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. My undergraduate degree was in computer engineering, mm -hmm. which means something a little different wherever you go. But at the University of Maryland, it basically meant that I got a foundation in software. Uh, I actually did a lot of Java and C for a while. And then after about the first two years, you focus mostly on hardware and really specialize in that. Mm -hmm. And then you came out of Stanford with a master's in computer hardware engineering. Yeah, pretty much. It technically says electrical on paper, but I did a very similar thing as my first degree, where I mm -hmm. customized the master's that it was kind of mostly hardware, but with a little software thrown in there as well. It seems like ma hardware versus software is like a fork in the road. You know, I know that there are, there are jack of all trades or jills of all trades who can do all of those things, but it seems to me that, that I, I hung a left you know, early on in my career. And I just, you know, I took EE-101, I took EE-201, I built an LCD clock, and that was it. And, you know, you kind of uh, have a little bit more of a well-balanced kind of a thing. I assume that you can take a piece of hardware apart. If you were at Goodwill and you found a clock radio, you can open it up and study it. You could, you know, have like a, you have, what, do, what do you guys have at your, uh, at Mind Tribe? Wreck it Wednesdays where you take <laughs> apart devices? We do, yes. We rip down all <laughs> sorts of things. And, and really understand it. Sometimes. Uh, we actually took apart an LCD monitor the last time, and you would be shocked how complex those are. So we actually spent about an hour reading documentation trying to figure out what it is we were looking at, even though we're all you know pretty good engineers. Okay, well, that, that makes me feel a little <laughs> bit better, because basically as far as I've gotten is I can take apart uh, like a clock radio or something and say, that's a capacitor. <laughs> <laughs> that's as far as it goes. Well, I know. I think that's why we end up taking forks in the road like we do, Scott, is because these hardware products are so complicated. Um, it takes years and years of work just to understand how your remote control works. Mm -hmm. or, but it's all right. based on those those core things, though. Like you know, objects are mo molecules, which are atoms. What powers what powers technology? Like if you get right down to it, electrons are flowing around, aren't they? Exactly. So these these electrons that are going from one place to another, whether it be in uh, like like I read about Intel processors going to thirty nanometers or some number of nanometers, they're talking about quantum physics and all sorts of things that happen at the smallest uh, the smallest sizes. The things that power everyday objects, whether it be the mouse that I've got or the microphones that we're talking on, this is kind of standard electronics. What is the term for this? Is this solid state equipment? You know, I pretty much just all call it computer hardware, and maybe okay. that's kind of a function of my background and what mm -hmm. my degrees are called, but that's how I think of it all is the hardware side. Mm -hmm. And there's electricity in everything. Even though I've got a mouse here where I haven't changed the batteries on this mouse in a year, someone designed that to take that much power and, and last for a year on batteries. Absolutely. 
Okay. And there's electrons in all of this stuff, electric current happening in everything from the 75, I think I need 75 volts for this, uh, this microphone. I'm not sure. <laughs> You've got me wondering. <laughs> I'm going to get shocked with all the different stuff that I've got on my, on my table here. That's serious business. But yeah, that's how it really works at the end of the day, Scott. Everything that we use runs on electrons moving from point A to point B through your hardware products. Now, whether that be a light bulb where you're heating up a filament and that's generating photons, uh, in a motor, you actually have electrons running through a coil, which is making a magnetic field, which makes the motor spin. It's all current, a current, which is what we call a flow of electrons, going from A to B. Okay, so break down uh, current and voltage, this idea of amps and volts, and then how wattage comes in, because I hear all of those terms, and I know that current is amps and... Uh, V is for volts. Break it down for me. Yeah, absolutely. You hear these terms thrown around all the time, volts, amps, power, watts. What does it really mean? Honestly, it's something that I really grappled with trying to understand for a long time myself. But now I think I've come to a point where I have a good, simple understanding, which I use every day on the job. Let's hear it. So basically how it works is you have, this, you have electrons. Mm -hmm. And electrons are really what powers these devices, like we've just said. Mm -hmm. But you, in order to get that flow of electrons from A to B, we have a voltage source. Okay. So simply put, we've got a voltage source and a path. And a voltage source is basically creating an imbalance of electrons. Because what you want is an imbalance of electrons that's going to want to even out. Ah, okay. So the voltrons are on the, the voltrons. Uh, <laughs> sorry, the voltage is on one side, and it really desperately wants to get to the other side. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about a voltage. It's not; it doesn't exist in any one place. A voltage is specifically defined as a difference between two places, and that mm -hmm. difference is how many electrons are at one place versus the other place. And those electrons being bunched up in one place, it's kind of like the flow of gravity. They just want to balance out. So when you have a voltage source, you're just talking about putting a lot of electrons in one place and very few electrons in another place. And because of exactly how the laws of physics works, those electrons want to even out. Okay, so voltage is potential. There you go. The okay. potential for electrons to flow from A to B. Okay, so then voltage, that's the uppercase V. Uh, and then current is what they call amps. And right. What is, how does that relate to volts? So you have your voltage, which is this bunch of electrons at one place and very few at the other place. Mm -hmm. And if you give them a way to balance out, those, elect those, current those electrons are going to move. And that motion of electrons made to be is what we call an electric current. Mm -hmm. Is this like current in water? It's a very similar concept. And a lot of people use kind of a water analogy to talk about voltage, current, etc. So you can think of actually a faucet as your voltage source. You turn on your faucet, and that water wants to run out of there. Mm -hmm. And actually, I like to take it a step further and really think about it like a hose on the outside of your house, for example. Okay. You turn on that, you turn like the, the lever there, and the water wants to rush out through your hose, right? Mm -hmm. And how much water is rushing out, that's your electric current. But there's another, there's a third concept, which I think is really important to understand, and that's called resistance. So there's going to be something trying to stop that flow from getting from A to B, and that determines exactly how much current is going to get through. And that's your resistance. So, for example, you think about your hose analogy. You turn on the faucet, the water wants to run, but if you have your, all these like kinks in your hose, mm -hmm. the water ends up coming out very slowly. And that's the same thing as having resistance in your path from A to B. It reduces the amount of current which can flow. Okay. Now, I, I see common numbers a lot using things like USB. Like, I hear that uh, this USB port can do 500 milliamps, but then sometimes I'll get an iPad, and I'll think that I can charge the iPad with 500 milliamps, and it says, no, no, you need 2.1 amps, which is 2,100 amps. But the voltage seems to be 5 volts everywhere. Why can't my little iPad be, be powered by a 5-volt, 500 milliamp USB port? Well, that's just a characteristic of your power supply, basically like your faucet. 
You mm-hmm. know, you can turn up your faucet in your bathroom as much as you want, but it will never put out enough water to fill up a swimming pool at any reasonable mm-hmm. amount of time anyway. And that's the same thing with the way your maybe a really a small power supply is designed to put out 500 mm-hmm. milliamps, maybe what you've got charging your USB mouse, for example. Mm-hmm. That's just not designed to put out enough current to charge a much bigger device like an iPad. Okay, so the using the water analogy, continuing that, the size of the pipe is just never going to be big enough. It's just, you know, like you said, filling up a, a, a pool with a, with a hose. It's never going to happen. There you go. Okay, so that's why my iPad will charge really fast when I have the right power supply, or it'll trickle charge, or even just stay, uh, stay, stay at a stasis point. I was using an iPad earlier today with my son, and it was at 3%. So I rushed off and I grabbed a power supply, but I got the wrong one. And he worked on the thing for an hour, and it was still at 3% at the end of the hour. So that means that the current going in just about matched what was being used by the device, and it kept it without being, without actually you know charging it. Yeah, that's exactly the case. And I had a very similar situation with a car charger the other day. I was trying to keep my phone from dying while using it as a GPS, but actually my car charger wasn't even putting out enough to sustain it. So it was just like slowly dropping down <laughs> because I was putting in not as many much current as it was drawing. Now, is there a pull, for, and forgive my ignorance, I'll be using incorrect terms here, but is there a pull versus push relationship here? Because I understand that I can use a 2-amp power supply on a device that doesn't need 2 amps, right? And it won't burn it out right? if they have the right amount of voltage. But if I get the voltage wrong, I'm going to, like, something's going to blow up. Right. And, and really, to answer that question, it's helpful to really break down what is the relationship between your voltage your current, and this concept of resistance I was describing. Okay. And that's pretty simple. It's a formula that goes V equals I times R, which means volts equals your current times your resistance. So, and I actually really, I generally think of that as like, take your volts, divide it by the resistance in your path, and then you're going to get the amount of current you can put out. So that's why you can use basically any power supply that says, you know, it can put out two amps, but it's at Mm -hmm. five volts. Because it's the resistance of what you're plugging into it, which determines how much current is actually going to flow. Ah, interesting. So it's not that the device is necessarily sucking up a certain amount of power. It's its resistance is set that it will it will enter in only so much. Only so much water, quote unquote, is going to get into this device by virtue of its characteristics. Right. It means that when you plug in that power supply, it's not going to automatically push that two amps through there, Mm. you know, potentially destroying your device if your device isn't made to have that many electrons running through it. Mm -hmm. It just means that that's the maximum size of the pipe. It's the amount of water that can go through that. But how much current is actually going to go through is determined by the device that you're trying to power. Okay. It's internal resistance. It's internal resistance. Okay. But if I took my... Uh, and we're talking, you know, DC here, of course, not AC power. If I took my iPad and somehow plugged it into my car battery, you know, car battery is going to be a 12 volt car battery, but it might have a thousand amps for a larger vehicle. What's going to go wrong? And, and and in how many ways did it go wrong? Well, then we got to think of that formula again. V equals IR. What you've done now is you've taken a device that's meant to be used with five volts. Mm-hmm. and you've instead given it 12 volts. And remember okay. that the resistance of that device is not changing. That's based on everything in its internal circuitry. Mm. So when you increase the V, but you keep the R the same, the I, and the I stands for current, is going to increase. So even though that device only wants to have a certain amount of current go through, you've now doubled, or more than doubled, the amount of voltage there, so more than double the amount of current is going to flow through it. And that's probably going to destroy it. Okay. Because a current flow through wires, it generates a byproduct that is heat. And other effects too, but heat is the first one you'll notice. So it actually means that everything in your device is going to heat up a lot more than it was meant to when you have too much current, and mm-hmm. things are going to start to fry. Ah, okay. So then all of this is going to start you know, flowing and it has nowhere to go. And that's where things overheat, blow up, capacitors inside blow up. Potentially, the, even the wires that are delivering that uh, that power could potentially not have you know, have a problem with that. Yeah, absolutely. It's we can go back to our water analogy, and if you know if you connect something uh, a hose that's only meant to 
sustain a certain amount of water flow, but you put it to a really, really powerful source of water, it's going to push as much through as it can. Eventually, things are just going to start to pop. Okay. So if I stay with, you know, stay in my lane with my five volts and my less than an amp or so of power, can I put together basic circuits, you know, with just the knowledge of V equals IR? You really can, Scott. That is going to do 90% of what you want to do as a very uh, entry-level hardware enthusiast. If you want to use an Arduino, if you want to use sensors, a V equals IR will get you very far. Okay. So the thing that I get a little confused about, though, then, uh, is inputs versus outputs. Like, I could take a battery and plug it into a motor, and the motor will spin. But if I wanted to have a sensor go into the, you know, you know, bring some input in, I don't know really what the voltage, how that works. The relationship between the voltage in, which might be very low, versus out for a motor, which might be quite high. You know what I'm saying? How would I combine that? Like, for example, someone says, you need to drive this 12-volt robot. Um, but I've got sensors that are from all different places. I might have uh, potentiometers that are turning things. I might have buttons. I might have IR sensors. Um, th- there's going to be different voltages coming into the system. I might have 3.3 powering the CPU and 5 powering this. Right. So there's a couple different ways you can approach that, Scott. Uh, the simplest thing to do is try to find all of your components that run on the same voltage. Oh, really? It's like, that's, it seems, I'm sorry if it was a dumb question, but, but like, yeah, try to stay with five volts. Yeah, right? no, that's a thing you can do. And it's not a dumb question at all, mostly because of my next point, which is that that doesn't always happen. Sometimes <laughs> you, you might try to find everything that can work with five volts, but that yeah. one sensor that you really need, oftentimes it just doesn't work with five volts. It needs 3.3. Mm-hmm. So you might often find yourself with multiple voltage sources being mm-hmm. used for your one circuit, your one project. And let me let me see if I understand. Then I would get I would add a resistor in that relationship to step the voltage down to three point three. That's absolutely one thing you can do. Um, we have that relationship V equals IR, right? Mm-hmm. And so you can actually add a bunch of several different resistors in steps through your circuits. Mm-hmm. And then as your current flows, that voltage will drop across, there'll be a drop across every resistance element in your circuit. So it'll drop a little bit across the first uh, resistor, it'll drop more across the second resistor, and the Mm -hmm. final resistor that you have connected to the low side of your power supply, which we call ground, that one will be at zero. So you can kind of make these resistance ladders, which bring your voltage down slowly. Okay. So I get the basics of plug a battery into a light or plug the battery into a motor, how, what are, how do sensors deal with voltage and, and where do sensors come in? Yeah, that's a great point. The first thing you're probably going to be thinking about as you start to do some basic projects are going to be, you probably have an Arduino and you probably have sensors and you want to mm-hmm. make that work with maybe the software knowledge you have as a software guy, Scott. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen there is that sensors are basically devices that put out a voltage in response to some kind of stimulus. So you might have a a thermal sensor, which puts out a voltage, one voltage when it's really hot, and a different voltage when it's really cold. Okay, so they're getting this voltage from me, because I'm, I've, you know, I've set up a rail of some kind, and I'm passing power to them, and then they can choose to, on their output side, give me high voltage or low voltage. Right, and I think you broke that down really well, is that there's generally like three pins in a sensor. You'll give mm-hmm. it the amount it needs to function. Maybe you'll connect it directly to your 5-volt source. Mm-hmm. But there'll be another output, which is going to be somewhere in between that 0 and 5 volts, for example. And that ah. output is a function of whatever that sensor is measuring. Okay, so let me imagine a temperature sensor. It's got ground, it's got 5 volts in, and then the third pin is something from 0 to maybe 5 volts again? Right. And then they've got some specification paper that I can look at that'll say this voltage equals this uh, this temperature. Right. And then I would have to map those things. There you go. And for every component you might use, that where that specification lives is in something called a data sheet. Okay. Every device you have will have a data sheet. Oh, this is like a real thing. Like you're not just. I thought you were being. You're trying to make like really make it easy for me. Like this is true. Like even you, as a professional engineer, you have to like. Oh, we gotta get the data sheet on this sensor every day. That's what I do. I'm looking for components to use in my project. I'm like, let me look up the data sheet for that oh, and wow. see how it works. 
Okay. So this is like prescription bottles have prescriptions, period. They all do, and it's standard. And once you learn how to read this, I can go in and look at these data sheets, and it'll make sense. Right. The only tricky part is that sometimes you might be looking at a poorly documented part, maybe coming from a, directly from a fabric factory in China, and you might not have a far, you might have a hard time finding the data sheet, or it might be in Chinese. I've had that happen once or twice. I've also had a couple of things. I've been trying to buy an HM-10 Bluetooth low energy device, and I'm getting uh, counterfeit ones. Yeah. That is something that can happen. And like, it says HM10, but it doesn't act like one. And then you go to the forums and it's like, yeah, we got a bad batch out of, you know, out of China or whatever last, you know, and make sure that you get the one. And they have pictures of like, here's the fake one and here's the real one. I'm like, wow, I never thought that was going to happen. Yeah, that's kind of a downside of, well, it's kind of great that all of our, all of our components are largely manufactured in China. Mm-hmm. Um, and it works out pretty well because we can get low-cost, high-quality components. Like the people at Foxconn, other big factories in China, really know what they're doing and do a great job. However, there is counterfeiting in China, which is kind of a big problem. So you, you do have to work with that sometimes. I've got this, uh, the Arduino right here. And on the top of it, it's got both uh, things marked D and things marked A. Uh, digital and I presume analog. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that's a good concept to understand. So what, what do I have to think about those things? I thought I was doing everything in digital now. So what we were talking about right now was analog. Mm-hmm. And that is, to not be too technical, it's basically a smooth function of voltage. Meaning that your voltage is between 0 and 5 volts, and the output of your sensor is something swinging around somewhere between 0 and 5 volts. But if you plotted it out, it would be kind of a smooth curve depending on what kind of input you're giving your sensor. Okay, so I'm imagining uh, a thing called a, it's a potentiometer, right? Right. This is me using fancy language. I'm feeling pretty excited about it. Uh, we were taking, the boys and I were taking apart an AM radio, and we were looking at how the tuner moved and everything. And this, this idea that I can just turn this knob and the voltage will go up smoothly, that's analog, you're saying? Right. Even though I'm thinking about 5 volts, which I usually associate with digital, that's just me mixing up things. That is absolutely an analog thing. And you can do a lot with analog, can't you? You can. And in fact, most everything was analog up until a relatively recent period of time. You know, if you think about old radio kits, that was all analog. Well, let me ask you this then. This, this theoretical temperature sensor that I want to work with, might there be an analog temperature sensor for Arduino and a digital temperature sensor for Arduino? Well, I don't think it would quite work like that, Scott, because pretty most sensors are going to be, well, at least most hobbyist sensors are going to be analog, meaning huh. they put out a voltage, you power it up, and then they put out some variable vo- voltage in response to what it's supposed to be measuring. But at some point, that analog voltage has to work with the digital world. It has to work with the ones and zeros in your programming language, for example. And so at that point, we get to a concept called analog to digital conversion. So Okay, and is that something built in, or do I have to think about that? That is something built in, and it's pretty simple. It takes a little bit of thought to understand exactly what's going on there and understand how to work with the output of your sensor, but in two minutes, you'll have it down. Okay, educate me. Okay. So you've got this Arduino and a sensor, and you want the two to talk to each other. And then you get into the concept of the Arduino's built-in analog-to-digital converter. Basically, the Arduino will look at the level of voltage on its input pin, and then it will turn that into a number that you can easily understand. So the Arduino has a 10-bit ADC, meaning it will give you numbers between 0 and 2 to the 10th, which is 1024, to represent its input voltages and it runs on 0 to 5 volts. So if you put in 0 volts to your input pin, it's going to give you a 0 number on the output. And if you put in 5 volts, it's going to tell you 1024. And anything in between is going to be a number in between those two. So 2.5 volts, for example, would be halfway from 0 to 1024. And now I... I know that now, but you're saying that it's actually a layer of abstraction that I should take advantage of. I should, I know it, but I don't have to know it. Yeah. You're going to want to know it to understand how to take the numbers Arduino is giving you and map those back to what the sensor is trying to tell you. But you don't really have to worry about most of the details there. 
there's only one concept you want to understand, and that is, how does this number actually translate directly to the voltage? Because from your data sheet, like we talked about earlier, it's probably telling you what voltages the sensor is putting out mean. And so to do that translation, all you have to do is divide the amount of voltage you're giving your Arduino by the number of, by the resolution of your analog to digital converter, which we've just said is uh, 10 bits or 2 to the 10th. So basically you take 5 volts and you divide it by 2 to the 10 or 1024, and you get the number of steps the Arduino understands. And you get kind of a conversion factor there. So how that works is you can take the number it's giving you and multiply it by that conversion factor, and you get back to the original voltage that the sensor is trying to tell you. Might I find myself you know, feeling like the numbers are weird and then going back there and saying, oh, this is out of spec. I maybe have a bad... Uh, a bad sensor is there, like how often would I find myself doing this math because I'm feeling like this is a really great thing for me to learn educationally and and then I would want to watch for you know numbers that don't feel right then go back to the specification documentation and say gosh this is out of spec I'm getting numbers that don't make any sense yeah that definitely happens um, a thing I've encountered all the time is when I'm looking at the numbers my Arduino is telling you and it's just one number uh, for example, I might have like a voltage sensor, and I'm kind of like messing with it, I'm playing with it, I'm expecting to see the numbers go up and down, but it's always telling me 1024. Oh, really? What does that mean? It means it's always telling me that the sensor is putting out 5 volts, and we okay. know that, sh that the output of the sensor should be changing based on how the temperature is changing when I'm exposing it to. Does that mean that you're either plugged into voltage when you pl wanted to be plugged into the sensor, or that you are have a, you have a bad sensor? Yeah, it could mean either of those things. Sometimes I check my circuit and I realize instead of connecting the right output pin to my analog input on my Arduino, I'm actually just connecting it directly to my power supply. <laughs> Which so that happens to you too. Oh yeah, that's sure. not just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that makes me feel better because I've had that kind of stuff happen a couple of times, and I was like, oh man, I really have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> happens to the best of us. There is a certain amount of just rubbing sticks together and hoping it's going to work out when you, you know, but at, at some point, I want to understand a little bit farther. I always talk about layers of abstraction. And that's why it's so great to have someone with your experience to talk to me through the kind of the 101 stuff, because uh, every additional layer of abstraction is indistinguishable from magic, you know. And uh, I think it's fun to sit down with an Arduino and do these kinds of things, but without actually understanding that I could take a multimeter. I'm holding an Arduino in my hand right now, and I could go and 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 watch this and and watch voltages change as I move through my through my paces. Is, is, would there be an inexpensive way to get an uh, an oscilloscope, which is that would show me voltage over time, wouldn't it? Right. So oscilloscope. You've mentioned the concept of a multimeter, which is something mm. that you can put at two spots in your circuit. And yeah, I probably should have told people. About that. <laughs> well, we're getting there. Yeah, thank you. So you take the, you've probably seen this multimeter, and you know if you've played around with electronics a little bit, you'll be familiar with the concept. But it's this little box which has these two electronic probes coming out of it, and you can touch those to different spots of your circuit. And what that's going to do is, generally speaking, when you have it on voltage mode, it's going to tell you the voltage difference between the two spots you're touching. So, for example, if you have your two terminals of a battery maybe a 9-volt battery, and you just connect it directly to your multimeter, you're going to see 9 volts pop up on your multimeter. But if you have one of those, but if you're somewhere in your circuit, you can basically, you generally take the black probe, which stands for your lowest potential, your ground point. Mm -hmm. So you'll touch that to the ground side of your battery, and then you can take the other probe and put it anywhere in your circuit, and it will tell you what the voltage is is that point in your circuit. Now, you said anywhere on my circuit. I can't hurt things, right, by doing that? Generally speaking, no, you can't. These multimeters, when in voltage mode, are designed to work with most about any voltage that you were going to find yourself throwing at it without anything bad happening. There are exceptions when you're working in, like, very high voltages. Uh, it gets a little trickier if you're using it to measure current, which is something we can talk about. Um, but generally speaking, for Arduinos and sensors, you're not going to have to worry. Okay, so I put the black on the lowest potential on the on what I think of as the ground. Right. And then I can move the red probe around pretty much anywhere and, and can kind of like see what voltage is at that point. Right. Does it doesn't necessarily tell me direction, does it? Does voltage have direction? Well, yeah, there you get that's a great point, Scott. You get into the concept of 
AC versus DC, alternating current versus direct current. Mm -hmm. So if in the examples I've been describing of kind of the, um, the water analogy, sensors, powering an Arduino, that's all been a direct current. You have a buildup of electrons in one place, you have this absence of electrons at your lowest potential, your ground terminal in another place, and you have a flow of electrons from the high potential to the low potential. Pretty straightforward. And along the way, it's powering your device, whatever it's flowing through. But an alternating current is a little different. An alternating current is when your current, your flow current, the direction it's moving, is actually switching back and forth at various speeds. Uh, and actually, all of the power transmission we use is an alternating current at a speed of 60 hertz. So 60 times a second, it switches direction. How does it move the 100 miles or 200 miles it has to move to get to my house if it's switching back and forth? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and I, It's one of those XKCD questions. Maybe he can write a book about that question. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good question for a power engineer who could really break that down in a way that even I, even I would give you like not a great explanation. No, it's, no, I didn't mean to put you on the spot because now you're going to make me go and look about. And this is what's great about podcasts like this is that you know we're going to have show notes and people are going to have conversations in the uh, in the comments and they're going to say, "Oh, there was a great video at how stuff works." It also makes me uh, in thinking about um, again these layers of abstraction. Like I, I know what I know. And I know exactly where it turns to magic. Where does this turn to magic for you? Like at the power engineer level, oh, like when you're driving underneath the power transmission line? In so many places. <laughs> <laughs> power is definitely one of them. Like mm -hmm. I know that AC is better than DC for long distance transmission of power. Mm -hmm. But could I tell you exactly why it's more efficient and why we decided on that 60 or 70 years ago? Couldn't break it down for you. Um, right. There are things I'm still learning about, which are kind of halfway between, like, I understand them and total black magic. Mm -hmm. um, the different kinds of wireless technology and when and why we use different ones, uh, different types of RF, uh, how exactly does a Bluetooth versus a Wi-Fi versus a cellular antenna work. Well, then wireless power. Yeah, wireless power is a huge one. Um, is it working by induction? Is it working by, I was reading about a startup that's using lasers to power things wirelessly. Yeah, no one's going to get hurt. You know. <laughs> yeah, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, yeah, so there's so many different facets of electronics that I have a good grasp on two or three of them, mm -hmm. and the other dozen are total witchcraft. So when when I start sitting down and getting at my multimeter and learning about my Arduino and starting to check things, what are some gotchas and some pitfalls I'm going to want to watch for? Like if I've got an LED that's not lighting up, or if something's going wrong... Uh, if I put something in backwards, what, what are some things I want to watch out for? Well, that brings us back to voltage and current and making sure that you have the right voltage at each place in your circuit, which mm -hmm. correspondingly is going to give your components either the current they need, the current they're expecting, or maybe too much or too little current. Mm -hmm. So for example, you mentioned an LED, and that's one of the first circuits you'll put together when playing around with hardware. Getting an LED to light up is basically the hello world of the hardware world. It's extremely satisfying. It is. <laughs> it, it's a great thing. I remember doing that in my first year of college, feeling like I, you know, pretty much had all this all electronic stuff wrapped yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> Next stop is an iPad. That's how I was thinking. <laughs> right. But how that works is that you have a voltage source, maybe five volts or a nine volt battery, something like that. Mm -hmm. You have your LED, and then you're going to want to have a resistor. And the reason you need that resistor is because if you were to connect your LED directly to your battery, you wouldn't have enough limitation on the amount of current that could flow. There's a tiny, oh. there's a tiny bit of resistance internal to, L to the LED, internal to the wires coming off the LED, but not, it, but not enough to limit the current to what you want it to be. So if you connected that battery directly to your LED, a bunch of current would start to flow and actually burn out your LED. Oh, really? It would just go poof, yeah. like a light bulb burning out? You might see it come on for a split second and then go dark. Oh, wow. And it's done forever at that point. And then it's done forever. So what you want to do is you actually put in a resistor there, and that resistor Ooh. limits the amount of current to a safe level. The standard amount of current for an LED, kind of an LED you might get at Fry's or SparkFun, is about 15 or 20, mil 20 milliamps.
Mm. So you look at your voltage source, 5 volts, 9 volts, something like that. Mm -hmm. You'll divide that voltage source by the amount of resistance you have available, or you'll take your I, which is 20 milliamps, and you'll figure out the number, the amount of resistance you need to make sure that 20 milliamps happens. Ah, uh, okay. So V equals IR. You'll figure out what R you need so that the I turns into 20 milliamps, depending on your voltage. And that's the resistor you need to put in your circuit. So the first thing I do, for example, if my LED is not lighting up, is I look at the value of that resistor, and I do my V equals IR, and I'm saying, okay, based on my V and my R, am I actually getting the amount of current I need? Around 20 milliamps? Or maybe I'm putting in too much. Or maybe I've grabbed a resistor that's too big, so I'm only getting like 1 milliamp, for example. And that might explain why it's not lighting up. So that kind of the amount of current and the amount of voltage, and playing with that V equals IR and making sure mm -hmm. it's what the data sheet says it could be, that's kind of the first place I go for a lot of my troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually brings me to this question. Since I have a, a hardware engineer here on the show, then you can diagnose as we close uh, what's wrong with my uh, my device here. We, my, the boys and I built uh, a thing called the useless machine, and it's a little box with a switch on the top, and I'll just... You, you, you push a button, you, put, you basically push a switch, and then a finger jumps out and then turns off. It turns itself off, basically. It's a box with a switch that turns itself off. And the guy has this very detailed spec, and I 3D printed the case, and I bought all the exact part numbers. But for whatever reason, the, the switch is really stiff. So I've got resistors in here. I've got a power, and I, I've gotten 3.3 volts going to the motor that, that hits the switch. And it just hits the switch and then stops. It doesn't have enough oomph to hit that switch and knock it off. So I just started upping the voltage because I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> and I've and I've never had this podcast recorded before. So I just said screw it because I have a crying seven year old at this point, and I put a nine volt battery in there. So instead of three volts, I'm pushing nine volts. Now this thing this thing turns off with a vengeance because boom, boom. What's going to go wrong with the fact that I've triple over volted this thing? So basically, the guy told you to put this 3-volt motor there, and mm -hmm. that for that 3 volts, the amount of current going through it, it generates a certain amount of torque in the motor. It makes the gives the motor ah. a certain oomph, right? Right. Now, it turns out that oomph wasn't enough for your project because you said your switch was a little stiffer than expected, something like that. Right. So what you did is you just kept upping the voltage, increasing the amount of current, and making the motor do more work than mm -hmm. it was designed to do. So it's working, and a lot of times, that's kind of the, the secret of electronics, <laughs> a lot of times something might say it's only rated to a certain amount of voltage or current, but mm -hmm. if you increase that number, it might keep working. But what you're doing is you're reducing the lifetime of that component. Oh, really? So that is a fact. Like, this will not last as long had I kept it at 3 volts. Right. It means all the internals to that motor are meant to work with 3 volts and the corresponding amount of current that's going to drive through the motor. Maybe all of the windings, all of the little wires inside, they only want to handle a certain amount of current, and after that, things are going to start to degrade, things are going to start to get too hot, example. So it'll keep working, but eventually it'll stop working before it was meant to, because you're just working it a little bit too hard. Okay, well, hopefully the seven-year-old will be in college by that time, <laughs> because uh, I glued the thing shut, and I don't know how I could fix it. <laughs> We'll call it a prototype for now. Yeah, you know, should be fine for now, but just something to keep in mind. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Hey, anytime. Thanks for having me on the show, Scott. It's a lot of fun. You can follow Andrew J. Dupree up on Twitter at twitter.com slash Andrew J. Dupree, and I will put show notes with information, including a great slide deck that Andrew created to teach me EE 101, as well as some great courses that you can take online for free and learn all about electrical engineering. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.